one afternoon in August of 2017, the gravitational wave detectors of LIGO and Virgo, two sites in the United States, one in Italy, realized that they had seen the fingerprint of a gravitational wave. Now, up to this point, they had seen a couple dozen gravitational waves from merging black holes. This was pretty routine, but there was something different about this particular signal. Usually the gravitational wave signal from merging black holes is very, very short, lasting less than a second. You get this rapid ramp up and then ring down and it's gone in a flash. But this gravitational wave signal it took over two minutes to ramp up and then fade away. There was something distinctly different about this particular signal. And the signal was clear. It was well above the noise. It was distinct. It was there. It was matching the templates. Something fishy was going on. Within a couple hours, the LIGO and Virgo teams confirmed that they did have a detection and sent out an alert to the worldwide astronomical community. But... Before they sent out that alert, the Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope sent out an alert of its own. And this alert was from the detection of something called a short gamma ray burst, a flash of intense gamma ray radiation. They had sent out their alert much faster because their data was much, much easier to process. But within a couple hours, after both the gamma ray burst alert and the gravitational wave alert, the astronomical community realized what they were witnessing. They were witnessing something called a kilonova. This kilonova had never been observed before in astronomy, but here it was in the form of a gamma ray burst and a gravitational wave signal. Now, the timing of the event was, was pretty opportune for astronomy because the event happened in the early afternoon in European time and early morning uh, in the Americas. And so astronomers had enough time to realize what was happening, send out priority alerts to observatories in the Atacama Desert in Chile. Some of our most powerful observatories in the world are located there. That night, they were able to observe the source of the gravitational waves in the gamma ray burst. That night, within 11 hours of the event, of the gravitational wave event, we had our first optical picture, visible light picture of this kilonova. Over the following days and weeks, observatories around the world would continue to monitor this site. Observatories, orbiting observatories would continue to monitor this site. We captured the process of this kilonova happen from the moment it occurred for weeks after in every wavelength of the electromagnetic spectrum plus gravitational waves. Uh, two months later, astronomers started publishing papers about it. There were a hundred papers ready to go within two months. There was an entire journal dedicated, an issue of a journal dedicated to these results. The summary paper that described had provided a broad overview of all the observations had a co-author list with over four thousand names on it, that is about one third of the entire astronomical community writing about this one event in 2017, writing about this kilonova. A kilonova, we get the name from the fact that this is more powerful than a nova, about a thousand times more powerful than a nova, but not as bright as a supernova. The kilonova process starts with neutron stars. Neutron stars are the leftover cores of massive stars, stars much, much more massive than the sun. When these stars go supernova or are about to go supernova, they form a core of iron in their centers. 
but the pressures, the intense pressures of the entire weight of that star cramming onto that iron nucleus cause electrons to get shoved into protons, turning them into neutrons and converting this massive core of iron into a giant ball of neutrons. And that giant ball of neutrons can temporarily halt the catastrophic gra gravitational collapse, and that's what triggers a supernova explosion. Sometimes the onrushing in the chaos, uh, a black hole can be formed out of that neutron ball, and sometimes the ball of neutrons survives as something we call a neutron star. Neutron stars are some of the most exotic objects in the universe, in some ways even more exotic than a black hole. Neutron stars, we're talking about an object a few times more massive than the sun, packed into an area no bigger than, say, Manhattan, spinning at up to tens of thousands of revolutions per minute. The gravity around a neutron star is so strong that it can bend light into the path of a circle, like light can orbit a neutron star. That's what we're talking about. So imagine one of these exotic, exotic objects in the universe colliding with another one. It's not going to be pretty. What you get is a kilonova. The actual radiation of a kilonova comes not from the collision itself. Well, the collision releases energy, of course, but it's not super bright. Instead, most of the light, the visible light, comes from the radioactive decay of elements after the merger takes place. After the merger takes place, sometimes if the masses are small enough, you can get just a bigger neutron star at the end. Sometimes you end up with a black hole. Sometimes the whole thing just obliterates itself. We had long thought prior to 2017 that neutron stars did collide, that they were responsible for something we called a kilonova. We had not observed a kilonova yet. We had observed the short gamma ray bursts, and we didn't know what was causing the short gamma ray bursts, which is why we just called them short gamma ray bursts instead of something more specific. We had suspected that it was due to merging neutron stars. We had suspected that merging neutron stars, when they do collide, do have a visible component that is about a thousand times brighter than a typical nova. We did suspect that merging neutron stars would release tremendous amounts of gravitational waves, ripples in the fabric of space-time itself. But until 2017, we hadn't detected it yet. So you can see why a lot of astronomers were interested in this event. Kilonova are relatively rare. There's only about one every 100,000 years in a typical galaxy. Contrast that with supernova, where you get a handful per century in every galaxy. But neutron stars, merging neutron stars, kilonova, play an essential role in the chemistry of, of life, like literally life. We get our elements through fusion. So the, the process of the Big Bang, in the first few minutes of the Big Bang, we get some hydrogen, some helium, a little bit of lithium, but who cares about lithium? Eventually, the hydrogen and helium combines in, in the hearts of stars to form carbon and oxygen. Those stars die and enrich the interstellar medium. If you get a massive star, you can fuse heavier elements. You can get silicon, magnesium. You can make it all the way to iron but you can't fuse past iron because fusing past iron, if you fuse elements heavier than iron, you lose energy instead of gaining energy. And so that's not a good power source for stars because it takes energy instead of releasing it. So we get a bunch of heavier elements from supernova explosions themselves where there's enough energy, enough parts flying around to fuse some of the heavier elements, but it's not enough. When you calculate how often supernova go off and how widely they can disperse their elements and, and how efficient that fusion process is and what kind of elements the fusion, the energies and densities uh, uh, prefer, you aren't able to fill out the periodic table. You need something else. Now that something else is merging neutron stars. That something else is kilonova. Kilonova, even though they're less powerful than supernova, have just the right mixture of energy and density and temperature and time scale to make many of the heavier elements in the periodic table. 
what happens is that when you have these two balls of neutrons and they collide together, you get all these fragments of neutrons flying around, colliding with each other, radioactively decaying, and it just like turns itself into elements. It's just like an heavy element factory when kilonova go off. We're talking gold. We're talking silver, platinum, xenon. You know, if, if you have gold jewelry on right now, that gold was most likely formed from merging neutron stars. The 2017 Kilonova event that we observed, we got to see what elements were produced because we saw the aftermath of the explosion. We could take the spectrum. We could figure out the elements. We're talking in that one explosion, like hundreds of Earth's worth of gold and silver, platinum, heavy metals. And I don't mean a hundred times more gold and silver and platinum than the earth has. I'm talking about like a hundred earths made of solid gold and silver and platinum. This is the real deal. Like kilonova are much more rare than supernova, but much more efficient at producing these heavy elements. And we witnessed it, we saw it. We're still following up with observations years later of that Kilonova event. The only way to get gold on the, on the earth to get the elements necessary for life itself is to merge neutron stars. Supernova alone just aren't going to cut it. But there was another little treasure in that Kilonova explosion in 2017. According to general relativity, which is our understanding of gravity, uh, gravitational waves travel at the speed of light. They just do. That's just what they do. But we know that general relativity isn't the final word on gravity. We know that general relativity is incomplete. General relativity cannot explain what's happening at the center of a black hole. It cannot explain precisely what's happening at the event horizon of a black hole. It cannot explain what's happening in the earliest moments of the Big Bang. We know where general relativity, where a modern understanding of gravity fails and breaks down. We can't explain dark energy, the accelerated expansion of the universe. You know, general relativity, our theory of general relativity is just silent. It's just like, okay, you got dark energy. I don't know what that is. Uh, do you? Like that's the best that general relativity has. So we know it's incomplete. We know it's wrong at some level. It's right in a lot of ways, but it's wrong at some level. So over you know the past century, basically ever since there's been a general relativity, we've been looking for extensions and modifications to it. These extensions and modifications we use to try to understand and explain, say, dark energy, or to explain what's happening at the center of a black hole in the earliest moments of the Big Bang. We have so many that like their theorists are rel relatively bored. They got a lot of time on their hands, so they, they cook up all sorts of crazy ways to extend and improve and enhance general relativity. And the vast majority of those theories uh, predict that gravitational waves end up not traveling at the speed of light because of various complicated factors. Like every theory is different, but in general, they say gravitational waves don't travel at the speed of light. Well, now we have this kilonova explosion in 2017 where we got the gravitational waves and we got the gamma rays from the explosion itself. They arrived within 1.3 seconds of each other. 1.3 seconds. Actually, the, the radiation, the gamma rays arrived first. That's not a big surprise uh, because the light actually got tangled up in the density of the material there in the explosion itself. It took a while to break out well, the gravitational waves, since they don't really interact with matter all that much, uh, just sailed right on through. So it's not a surprise that the gamma rays came first, but that 1.3 seconds is important. This event, the Kilonova event, happened 140 million years ago. The event happened 140 million years ago. So the gravitational waves and the light waves were racing each other for 140 million years, and they arrived at the Earth within 1.3 seconds of each other. That is essentially the same speed to one part in a million billion. 
Now we can say with this one observation of this one kilonova in 2017, that gravitational waves travel at the speed of light to an accuracy of one part in a million billion. That's a billion times better than any previous measurement. And it effectively killed almost every single, if not all extensions to general relativity. All theories of modified gravity that we have cooked up to explain dark energy, centers of black holes, early universe, whew, gone with one observation because it looks like gravitational waves do travel at the speed of light. You can't get around it. That one observation killed entire fields of physics, which is how it goes. There's going to be more of this. Since 2017, there hasn't been a confirmed kilonova detection again. There have been some candidates, uh, but there haven't been ones where we've been able to match up with the gravitational waves and an electromagnetic counterpart. But there's more on the way. Astronomers are super excited by what they call multi-messenger astronomy. This is where you can look at the same event with different tools. You can look at electromagnetic radiation of different wavelengths. You can look at neutrinos. You can look at gravitational waves. And each one of these tells you different things about the event. No, no, one isn't more important than the other. They just tell you different things. The gravitational waves tell you, uh, in the case of the kilonova, what's happening right when the neutron stars merge. The gamma rays tell you what happens right after they merge. The electromagnetic waves tell you what happened minutes or hours or weeks after the event. So by combining all of it, you get a complete and total picture of this extreme event. And astronomers love extreme events because it exposes a lot of really, really cool physics. And like, hey, modified gravity, like intense magnetism and electromagnetism, uh, cosmic rays, a uh, neutrino physics. Like, like there's so much cool physics happening in extreme events. It's like nature's own laboratory. And multi-messenger astronomy allows us to look at nature's laboratory with as many instruments as possible possible. So everyone's very excited for multi-messenger astronomy. Everyone's very excited for more gravitational wave observatories. Everyone's excited for gravitational wave observatories in space. Everyone's excited for email. Like, like there are these, all these automated notices that go out now. Like when one observatory sees something interesting, they, they send, tell all the other observatories and they say, well, yeah, we should look at it. We should prioritize that target and we should look at it too. do a follow-up. So this like global, synchronized, multi-observatory, multi-wavelength, multi-messenger, uh, there's going to be more papers in the future that feature thousands of co-authors because everybody who's got a telescope or an observatory and antenna can now participate in this multi-messenger astronomy game and we can learn more about the universe. So yay. Thank you so much for watching. Please don't forget to contribute. That's patreon.com slash PM Sutter. I really do appreciate it. Please like, share, and subscribe. Hope you like the show, and I'll see you next time.